first of all, <clears throat> hello and welcome to this AI Sprint webinar on the AI Sprint uh, personalized healthcare use case. We have a really fantastic mix of experts with us this afternoon from the directly from the um, Stroke um, Alliance and also from one of the Spanish National Fund um, Association, but also a medical expert and a, a research um, expert as well. So a really nice mix of perspectives on the agenda this afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome also all of our panelists then and, and pass the floor to them for a quick introduction. Thank you, panelists. Hello, my name is Arlene Wilkie and I am from the Stroke Alliance for Europe. Hello, my name is Davide Cirillo. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Life Sciences Department of the Barcelona Super Computing Center. Good afternoon, I'm Enara Aran and I am a doctor in pharmacy and now I am an international R&D project collaborator at Friend Alictus Foundation. Thank you very much everyone for being here with us this afternoon. So I'd like to now pass the floor to Arlene to give us some insights into stroke incidents in Europe. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and you'll be able to share your screen. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> Just give me a few seconds to share my screen with you. I hope everybody can hope everybody can see, see my, my, my presentation. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I'd like to thank um, the organisers for, for, for asking me to present today. Um, my name is Arlene Milkey and I am the Director General of the Stroke Alliance for Europe. Today um, um, you've asked me to talk to you a little bit about um, stroke and its incidence in Europe. So I'll tell you a bit about stroke, I'll tell you why we need to be building up better prevention and healthcare uh, for people with stroke. And I'll tell you a little about the Stroke Action Plan for Europe, just in case you don't know about it. And if I've got time, I will cover um, a little bit about our prevention work as well, just in case you're interested. So first of all, a little bit about the Stroke Alliance for Europe itself, just so you know who, who, who we are and who I am representing. We are the only umbrella organization for stroke support organizations in Europe. And for those of you who don't know, a stroke support organization is an organization in your country who will help provide information and support, oh, my apologies, information and support to people after they've had a stroke. So this might be in terms of helping them get back to work, get back to education, managing through the, the, the financial system, the social care system, or just to talk to other people that have had stroke. And um, today on, on the call, I know you'll hear from Freno Alectus, who are one of our, our, our Spanish um, stroke support organizations, and it's great to have them as, as members of SAFE. So collectively together, we are working to reduce the numbers and effects of stroke across Europe. And we do this collectively by raising awareness of prevention. We want to ensure that everybody receives access to care, rehabilitation and life after stroke. And we do this by raising the profile of stroke at the EU and national level. And we want to encourage and grow stroke support organisations in each country in Europe. So let's move on to um, stroke in Europe. Um, I'm sure you all know this, but very quickly, what is stroke? Um, it can be caused by a, a blockage of the blood to the brain. Um, this is um, the most common type of, of, of stroke. Uh, it can also be caused by a bleed from a, a burst blood vessel. This, this is less common, but, but, but can also um, exist as stroke. When a stroke happens, the brain cells are then deprived of oxygen, which can cause catastrophic problems for individuals if they are not treated quickly, which is why you see those adverts about acting quickly. So to get to the emergency care on time, because there are a few treatments available depending on the kind of stroke that you have. For example, you can have a, a clot busting agent or a, a, another treatment is that you can have the, um, the clot 
removed surgically itself. So those, those are those are just a very quick review of stroke um, and and why and 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 and, and how it can be treated. In terms of incident incidents, um, which you're 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 all very interested in in learning about today, uh, we currently estimate that one in four people will have a stroke in their lifetime. We also know that the population is aging, and that there is a strong risk, a strong association between stroke risk and age. Therefore, we will expect to see the number of people having a stroke to continue to rise as, as the years go on. And in 2019, um, the Stroke Alliance for Europe published some research on the economic impact of stroke in Europe. And I've just given you the, um, the web link there. And overall, we found that if we do nothing, the number of people living with stroke is projected to increase. Now, this was only in about 34 countries that we were able to, to gather the data from. So you can imagine the numbers will be bigger. So we are projecting from 9 million to 12 million. And in terms of cost, we also looked at that as well. And we were able to show in 2017 that across those 30 countries that we reviewed, these are the costs of, of stroke care. And we were able to show how much it costs to treat people in hospital, how much it costs to treat people in nursing homes and residential care, and also how much the value was towards those unpaid carers who look after those stroke survivors when they're not in hospital. And we were also able to look at the costs of stroke that were lost due to deaths and disability um, of people who, who had had a stroke. So we were able to show that in 2017, the costs were 60 billion in those 30 countries in Europe, and this will increase to 86 billion by 2040 if we do nothing as, as a community. So, so what? What's the impact of this on the actual individuals um, that, 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 that we see? So as I said, we currently have one in four people who will have a stroke in their lifetime. The majority of these people will survive their first stroke and will be able to resume a, a normal life, but very many of them will experience a disability after stroke. And the level of seriousness depends on where the, the, the stroke has happened and how much of the brain has been injured um, or, or affected. And common problems that, 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 that we hear about or know about are that people will have problems in their movement, they will have problems in their speech or understanding language, they will have problems in their thinking and memory, they will have sensory issues, so, so sight issues, and they will have emotional problems as well. So what I'm describing here is, it becomes quite a complicated pathway for those individuals when they have a stroke. It isn't just in hospital, having the acute care and having a little bit of rehabilitation within a couple of months of them having a stroke. This can be ongoing and lifelong. For some people, their strokes can impact their life for the rest of their life, which makes the, the care pathway and providing health care for them very complicated. And this is just a couple of them. Um, I've got two slides of just some quotes for some people um, just talking about um, in some areas there are no uh, stroke units and there are some areas where there are guidelines, but these guidelines aren't implemented. We know there are inequalities within and between countries and we know that patients families are not supported and when they leave hospital this is when things become particularly difficult for, for, for patients and I'm afraid I have got a quote in there from Spain I apologize but this quote from from Spain is saying that life after stroke is the poorest point of, of the care process and to add to this problem we've had a pandemic so adding to the incidence problems, the cost problems, the access to care problems I've just described, 
individuals who are having a stroke or who have survived a stroke have suffered terribly during COVID. It has put a huge uh, strain on the health systems. And what this has meant for individuals is that we have seen a decrease in the number of strokes that have been diagnosed. And we know this is because emergency departments have not been able to take in so many people because of social distancing and lockdowns. People have been scared of going to hospital for fear of catching COVID. And we do know that the number of deaths hasn't, the number of deaths hasn't decreased. We just know that the number of strokes in homes has been more than in hospitals. In addition to delay in diagnosis, we also know there's been a delay to treatment. So appointments being scheduled, people not being safe again to go to hospital and people not being receiving the, the, that essential rehab that they need, again, because of just, just lack of care being available to them. We know that also prevention um, screening has also been um, decreased as well for the same reasons as I've mentioned above. And really importantly, there has been an increase in mental health issues. I can't imagine being stuck in your house, having just had a stroke or, or recovering for a, from a stroke, not being able to get your care and the, the, the anxiety and depression that this is causing and people being even worried more than ever before about their health and about what the future holds. So I'm painting a bit of a, of a grim picture here. Um, it's a bit of a, a sad picture for, for stroke across Europe. There aren't that many treatment options. There's a lot of research going on. So we, we hope we will see more in the future. There are increasing numbers. There are increasing costs if countries don't change their healthcare systems. And we know it's a debilitating condition. And we know that care across the whole care pathway is poorly coordinated. So I suppose what I'm saying to, to you on the call today, that a stroke is a bit more than just a stroke. It's not just that one-off event that just happens to you. It can cause enormous problems um, to, to patients and stroke survivors throughout Europe. And our pandemic has only gone and made things worse. So just in my last couple of slides, we know that prevention and personalised healthcare is key. I know that's something that, that, that you're looking at in your research project. And I also wanted to pick up, I, I'm, you, might want, you might be interested, I, can you see it? Oh, can you see it? I think you did see it. Oh, it's called, <laughs> oh, there it is. It's called the Stroke Action Plan for Europe. Apologies, I think you might just have seen it flash in front of me. The Stroke Action Plan for Europe, I think, is a tremendous piece of work. And it outlines um, a common goals um, that were set up between um, stroke support organisations and our medics across the whole care pathway. And in terms of um, prevention and specific around prevention and um, personal health care, I thought you'd be interested in that there are three relevant overarching targets that you might be interested in knowing about because your work could lead to helping us achieve these. We want to reduce the numbers. The plans have got to encompass the whole care pathway, including prevention, and we want to have full public health um, awareness campaigns so that people know about lifestyle and reducing risk, etc. And just finally, um, another just a little slide on uh, the Stroke Action Plan for Europe that um, there is a particular target under primary prevention, which talks about achieving universal access to treatment through improved and better personalized risk prediction. So again, that might be something that, that, that's very much related to, to the work that this project's doing. So by doing your work, you could be helping us achieve um, the, 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 the targets and recommendations of the Stroke Action Plan for Europe, which is fantastic. Um, do have a just a little bit of a, of a prevention slide here if you're at all interested in knowing what SAFE is doing around um, prevention and stroke. We have um, a website that has 10 modifiable, 10 modifiable risk factor information available to the general public and we have available in six different languages. Now with that Stephanie, I hope I have not overrun my time. I'd like to say thank you so much. I hope I have outlined to you the problems and the issues that stroke causes and base is faced by stroke survivors. 
And I really do wish you all the best with your research. Um, and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you so much, Arlene. That was brilliant. And it was one very powerful message. In fact, as you were talking about, um, you know, you're giving your presentation, I was thinking of stroke as a verb, you know, when we say stroke a dog, and it seems like a really, okay, it's a gesture that we can repeat many times, but it's a short gesture, isn't it, Arlene? And you've shown, I think, of the many Im impacts and ramifications of what having a stroke means to so many people yeah, in the world. So I think that was a really brilliant um, overview, really, really insightful. And I don't think we could, you know, healthcare, and you mentioned also COVID-19. And I think this is one of the many examples that, um, where we've seen, a lot, because everyone's focus has been on, on the pandemic itself, we have like lost sight a lot of the so many, many, many patients globally who have suffered because of the, you know, of the lack of treatment or delayed treatment or, you know, mental issues and, and, and increased anxiety. So that was a really powerful message. And I thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. We'll speak to you later in the panel discussion. OK, so thanks very much. So now it's my pleasure to pass the floor to... Davide, um, uh, I'll just let me give Davide Cirillo from the Barcelona City Computing Center. He leads the um, use case in AI Sprint on personalized healthcare with its focus on stroke prevention and treatment. Um, it's one example, I, we hope, of many that will raise, also help raise awareness of the need to take action and to try and find solutions and improve treatment. So with no further ado, Davide, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. I'll stop sharing Thank my you. screen so you can share yours. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction and uh, thank you, uh, everybody. I, okay, I think now you can see my screen. Uh, it is a, a, a real pleasure for me uh, today to introduce the personalized healthcare use case of the AI Sprint project. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, for this. Uh, it is uh, it is uh, really really a, a honor to uh, to talk about this today. So I my name is Davide and I am a, a postdoctoral researcher in the computational biology group in the life sciences department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, the our department, together with the uh, computer science department, uh, is uh, uh, one of the partners in uh, this outstanding consortium that is uh, AI Sprint, and that is uh, uh, coordinated by the Politecnico di Milano. So, um, first of all, the goal of, uh, of this uh, European project is to enable artificial intelligence in the so-called uh, computing uh, continuum. So what is this computing continuum? It's basically this multi-layered space uh, in which you have, uh, in which you can perform computation, and you can, and you have two extremes. One is the cloud, and the other is the edge. So the difference uh, is in the distance of the two, those two extremes from the data that is produced, and on top of which you do computation. So uh, while the cloud is generally far from the places where the data is generated, the edge is actually very close to the places where the data is generated. And one example of an edge uh, device uh, where we can uh, uh, compute stuff, it's basically the smartphone. So the smartphone is something that we always have uh, with us. It's basically a, a little computer uh, that is at the edge, meaning that is close to other devices that can produce data. And uh, those other devices are, for instance, uh, smart watches uh, or cameras or sensors, uh, all uh, IoT devices that are actually the source of the data that those uh, uh, age, uh, that, that, that those edge devices can then compute and share and communicate with, uh, with the cloud. So this very complex uh, uh, architecture need to be, uh, to be you know, enabled uh, in order for uh, artificial intelligence to, um, to work effectively uh, in, uh, in, inside this. 
And indeed, the AI Sprint project uh, is organized in a way that all the components and all the tools and everything that is needed to make this happen is actually in place. So for instance, we have groups working on uh, design times tools, uh, groups working on uh, runtime tools, groups working on the security. And all this architecture is uh, demonstrated uh, through uh, three use cases. And uh, here is where the personalized healthcare use case is together with other two use cases. One is uh, about maintenance and inspection of uh, uh, windmills using uh, drones. And uh, the third one is about uh, farming. And this is uh, um, in particular uh, focusing on the optimization of uh, phytosanitary treatments in those fields. So those are three examples of very different uh, areas in which uh, this kind of uh, uh, AI powered um, uh, computing continuum between the cloud and the edge can be applied. So today we are going to talk about the personalized healthcare use case uh, that is that aims to develop uh, uh, automated systems for uh, personalized stroke risk assessment and uh, uh, prevention. So um, in order to do so, we uh, uh, want to leverage uh, smart wearable devices that are more and more used in uh, cardiovascular care, as you can see from this image from a very recent uh, review on this topic. So those wearable devices uh, uh, come in different forms and shapes. You can see on the left that they, we can have uh, patches, uh, we can have uh, chest straps, uh, but we can even have socks and rings that are uh, um, collecting uh, information uh, using sensors. And those sensors uh, are different uh, uh, and they can measure different things. So in the case of the smart watches or the smart bands, uh, the two typical sensors that are uh, embedded and in particular used for cardiovascular care are the uh, photoplatismography, uh, PPG, and uh, the electrocardiogram, ECG. So PPG is able to um, uh, measure the um, heart pulses and the heart rhythms, uh, while the HEG is the electrocardiograms that we are all familiar with. So very precise and, uh, from the analysis of the heart waves uh, that comes from, uh, from the electrocardiograms, we can really uh, like uh, have uh, big insights on the uh, status of the health of our heart and cardiovascular system. So um, as we heard from, uh, from the previous presentation, uh, um, uh, stroke is a measure uh, issue worldwide for, for, uh, for the uh, well-being. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the, the great majority of, uh, uh, of uh, strokes, even if they are uh, very difficult to predict, even impossible, they are definitely uh, preventable. And this is because uh, uh, they are strongly associated with uh, um, uh, risk factors, very specific risk factors that are mostly associated to um, uh, the lifestyle, lifestyle choices uh, uh, entailing uh, nutrition, uh, uh, physical activity, and, uh, and other things like smoking and, uh, and many others. So by knowing those risk factors, we can uh, uh, prevent uh, the stroke. Uh, but when the stroke occur, and this can occur multiple times, of course, we need um, solutions. And, uh, and the, the, the personalized healthcare use case is actually focusing on this type of solution by uptaking artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, strategies. So um, in, uh, this will play out in basically in two uh, main uh, pillars. One is the collection of data uh, from uh, uh, smartwatches uh, and uh, uh, and the smartphones, and on the other hand, uh, uh, we will use this uh, this information, this data, to train model, basically to stratify patients in a personalized uh, uh, way. And this will happen in a pilot study that will likely happen starting from uh, next year, uh, in which a group of volunteers will be recruited by the uh, Frenolictus Foundation, and those uh, individuals will be given. Uh, um, a wearable device, a smart band uh, that will be connected to their um, smartphones in a, in a secure way. And, uh, and they will be instructed on how to use those devices. And those devices will uh, 
essentially monitor in a, in a privacy preserving, uh, continuous and non-invasive way the heart activity of those uh, people for an observation time that can be three, four months. Uh, and uh, by collecting this information, this digital information, together with a questionnaire on uh, uh, stroke risk, cardiovascular risk factors um, that has been uh, uh, provided and reviewed by our medical advisor, Dr. Maria Alonso Lesignana, who is uh, with us today, um, uh, we are going to, uh, to create those artificial intelligence model for better understanding how uh, to stratify those individuals in different levels of risk and what kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, strategies we can, uh, uh, we can perform in order to, uh, to provide a better, uh, a better care for them. Um, so all this, of course, uh, is involving uh, um, uh, human participants. Uh, this is, uh, uh, those are volunteers. And so everything is, uh, uh, all the data will be uh, anonymized and uh, will be compliant with uh, GDPR uh, regulations. Um, so uh, as for the, uh, the device itself, uh, this is uh, called uh, uh, RITMI. It has been uh, uh, manufactured by a Spanish company. And uh, uh, as I said, it's connected, it can be connected to a smartphone through an app. Uh, that is able to alert the, the person um, uh, if uh, an atrial fibrillation is occurring. An atrial fibrillation uh, is uh, an arrhythmia that is strongly associated to, uh, to stroke. This uh, alert uh, comes from an algorithm that is in, embedded in this, uh, in this device and uh, uh, that is based on the PPG sensors. So this can also be confirmed through an electrocardiogram. It's very easy for the person to perform an electrocardiogram by because like this person uh, only had to uh, put uh, their finger on the on the sides of uh, of this device as you can see on the on the right but there are many other sensors actually embedded in this uh, uh, in this uh, um, smart band there is an accelerometer there are uh, um, sensors for temperature oxygen saturation so essentially what we are set out to do is to take all this information all those variables together with the lifestyle questionnaires that I was mentioning before, in order to train those uh, um, uh, algorithms and uh, those models. And the way we want to train those models is, is through a privacy preserving procedure that is called uh, federated learning. The, the general, let's say, approach is, uh, can be described as follows. Basically, what you generally do when you want to train an artificial intelligence system is to bring the data to the model in order to train it. While in the federated learning, we are actually doing the other way around. You are um, bringing the model uh, to the data. And this is a, is a way of um, ensuring the, the preservation of the privacy and the security of, uh, of the data that basically don't move around. They, they just stay where they are, where they are uh, generated. In particular, uh, has it, it works in uh, four steps in a recursive way. It's very easy. I'm going to, to explain very quickly. Essentially, you have uh, a central model that you want to, to train, and you uh, make a copy of this model in the local devices at the edge. Those can be, for instance, the smartphones of those people. And then each one of those uh, local model will be trained in an independent way. So this model, local model, will see only the data that they that, that they will be, um, you know, uh, 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 exposed to uh, locally. Uh, and the only thing that at the end will be shared uh, with the central model uh, are the parameters of those different uh, uh, local models. So this is a way, if you think. Uh, uh, Closely, it's a way of uh, training a central model without never seeing the, the data that stay there and on, only the parameters are shared. So this is you know, a, a complicated and convoluted, <laughs> probably, way of uh, training a system uh, in order to maintain uh, the privacy of, uh, uh, of the data, which is uh, extremely important. I'm joking, but actually, this is uh, one very promising uh, approach for uh, achieving uh, accurate uh, uh, models that are able to perform the task, like in this case, the stroke risk assessment, without, uh, um, uh, without uh, you know, uh, man by maintaining uh, the, uh, the privacy requirements 
uh, of, uh, of this case. So um, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, uh, yes, if you have any question, you can uh, uh, write in the chat or uh, talk about this during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think it's really interesting. Okay, this is one example of how we can help improve um, um, treatment and prevention around um, strokes. I think it's really particularly interesting that you uh, mention how the federated learning takes them, you, does the opposite way round of what would be a typical AI approach, and that's to um, move, take the model to the data rather than the way round, so we can uh, ensure that there's data privacy there. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Why do you think this is particularly important? Yes, absolutely. So um, first of all, the, the, the ethical concerns. Uh, uh, so the, the data is, uh, is uh, personal data. And uh, the person, uh, of course, will, uh, you know, will, um, will undergo this, uh, this pilot study uh, uh, through a consent. So this person will be informed of uh, all the aspects uh, uh, about the project, but still, uh, there are uh, regulations that uh, that really are uh, you know um, uh, stressing the importance of maintaining the privacy of the personal information, and uh, and I think that, uh, that that this is fundamental. And uh, so these kind of strategies, like for instance the federated learning, but there are uh, there are many others, are are ways of uh, um, you know achieving uh, the, the the realization of artificial intelligence because we need to train those models but in a way that uh, uh, the, the 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 person that is producing the data the, the data stays with the person that is producing the data so it's not um, shared with anybody cannot be um, uh, cannot be like uh, stolen or uh, or uh, for instance uh, uh, used for other purposes uh, so I think that this is extremely important from uh, from an ethical point of view, from a legal point of view, and uh, and in particular with this kind of uh, healthcare uh, uh, applications. Yeah, and perhaps taking a, a healthcare um, use case to demonstrate this or to explore it further is important because ethics is an important part of healthcare. The GDPR has some special clauses also on healthcare data, so. I think this will be very interesting to see how this develops further on as we continue our work in AI Sprint. So thank you very much, David. We'll talk to you again in the panel discussion in a short while. So the pleasure now is to pass the floor to Anara from the, um, the, the um, Foundation Flynn uh, the Spanish Association, as a um, stroke support organization. And um, this is a little bit of a joint presentation now because we have our colleague, Rita, who will also be showing a video after your um, brief introduction. So the floor is yours, and Anara, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank AI Spring Consortium Partners to give us the opportunity to participate in this amazing project. And of course, in this interesting webinar, uh, in the name of Fernando Alictos Foundation, we are very grateful to, to participate in this project as we firmly believe that it is very important that in, the, in this kind of research project in which innovative technology, technologies are developed, patient organizations and foundations are taken into consideration with the aim of detecting our needs and being an active part of the project and technology development from the beginning. So uh, not to go much longer, I would like to explain to you very, very briefly who we are. We are Freno Alictos Foundation. We are a non-profit organization working to develop and promote actions, projects, campaigns, and activities with the aim of eliminating the personal, familiar, and social drama of being affected by a stroke in our society. We promote different initiatives and projects that aim to reduce the social impact of stroke in Spain through the culture of knowledge, inclusion, and prevention, reaching all possible groups, such as young people, social and healthcare professionals, researchers, business, education, and politics, which they are a key to achieve this multiplier effect and reach the largest possible population in order to change the actual uh, stroke situation in our case in, 
in Spain. So we are currently focusing on three key lines of work. Uh, the main one, one is information, a second one is investigation, and the third one is inclusion. And we are working on different projects to address these kind of needs. And for more information, we have an official web page, so it's open to, to you to dig more and know more about our activities. So you are welcome to, to visit the, the web page. And getting to the point and focusing on the main objective of this, of, of this webinar, I would like to introduce our foundation president and founder, Julio Agredano, who suffered a stroke at the age of 40. And due to agenda issues, he has not been able to participate in this webinar today with us, but he has left us a message in the form of a video in which he tell us about his life experience and how he perceived the incorporation of new technologies into the stroke care pathway. Uh, so Rita or Stephanie, Rita, I think, please, can you press play button to see what Julio has to tell us today? And I hope that he can provide you with very, very interesting information. Buenos días, me llamo Julio Agredano y soy el presidente de la Fundación Freno Dictus. Soy paciente de Ictus. Tuve un Ictus con 39 años. Eh, la gente piensa que es una enfermedad exclusiva de gente mayor y además la gente piensa que es una enfermedad eh, no prevenible, en la que no podemos incidir para cambiar la situación. Bueno, pues en mi caso, como en la gran mayoría de los casos, eh, tiene que ver con una mala promoción de la salud. Tiene que ver con cosas que podemos vigilar o cosas que podemos controlar. Eh, revisiones médicas periódicas, hábitos alimenticios, actividad física, eh, seguimiento y control de ciertos factores de riesgo. Entonces, para eso, eh, la tecnología tiene un papel importante, un papel fundamental. Es decir, eh, la tecnología es la que nos puede permitir, de alguna forma, darnos información de ese estado de salud que tenemos, ese estado basal y esos riesgos posibles que podemos controlar. La tecnología, además, puede alertarnos de que algo eh, va a ocurrir, algo, algo malo en forma de ictus va a ocurrir. Eh, el mejor ictus es el que no ocurre, es decir, eh, hay que invertir mucho a nivel de prevención porque el ictus una vez que pasa es una enfermedad devastadora, es una enfermedad que no solamente sufre el paciente sino que sufre el entorno, es una enfermedad de la cual es muy complicado de recuperar, que tiene un nivel de impacto a nivel de secuelas, de discapacidad, incluso de dependencia muy elevado, eh, por eso es súper importante, eh, es fundamental intentar reducir la mayoría de lo posible el impacto que está provocando a nivel de prevalencia. Eh, la Sociedad Europea de Ictus está tasando que en los próximos 15 años habrá un 35% más de Ictus en nuestro entorno, en la Unión Europea. Y tienen que ver con envejecimiento de la población y tienen que ver con adaptación de estilos de vida. Dos cosas en las que claramente podemos trabajar en la prevención de la enfermedad. Dos cosas en las que la tecnología y la tecnología preventiva tienen mucho que decir. Por eso eh, quería daros mi testimonio y bueno, poner herramientas o poner eh, bueno, pues, eh, ciertas barreras para que eh, intentar reducir ese impacto que está generando, ese drama personal, familiar y social que representa en nuestro entorno, que representa en nuestro continente. Muchas gracias y saludos. Buenos días, me llamo Julio. Well, that's yet another powerful um, testimonial, isn't it, to the importance of um, what we're trying to do here and all the work that is carried out by your, your association, Anada, and also by SAFE um, as well. So uh, what we'd like to do now, so thank you very much. Thank you, Rita, for supporting this and making it happen with your little magic wand. Um, what we'd like to do now is launch a couple of polls with the audience, and then we will... Um, um, go into the interactive panel discussion because we have another very special guest with us this afternoon. But first of all, I'd like to ask colleagues um, to launch the first poll with the audience, thanks. So the first poll to the audience is, how much would you say you know about emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, high performance computing applied to healthcare? And this is really important for to understand a little bit, you know, your basic knowledge about how te these technologies and how they can um, serve use cases like the one that we're looking at this afternoon. So I would say let's launch it. 
it's the, this is just to the audience. None of the house or the panelists are voting. So it's up to you. Please vote. Um, and then we'll stop the vote um, in a, a minute or two. Um, how far are we? How many people have voted from the audience in terms of percentage? Can we close? And yeah, a little bit more than half. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, then it's, an interesting, it's an interesting finding, though, so far, wouldn't you say, Nicola? Yeah, I think it seems that, yeah. you know, the majority of people uh, mm. uh, are aware of this. So, uh, I guess we, mm. you know, uh, we are speaking to the you know, the right target group, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think we can pass to the second question. Yeah, okay, thank you. So the second question is asking you, what's your general perception of these technologies from very negative to very positive? We know that there's a lot of um, emphasis, at least in your, from a policy and regulation perspective, on ethical AI because there are a lot of concerns of how technologies or even human behavior can help or harm citizens. And there's still a lot of work to be done in the area. We hope as AI Sprint that we'll be able to contribute to this. So please go ahead and vote. Nicole, again. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Surprising answer here. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So, as Stefan was mentioning, you know, there's, or, you know, there's some, uh, let's call it fear or probably misconception uh, in general public about these emerging technologies. So, I think we can safely say that's not the case here. So. No, yeah, good to see that there's a yeah, yeah. positive attitude, in fact. Yeah, okay, thanks. And we'll, uh, okay, thanks very much then. So we'll, let me just share my screen again just to remind the audience who we have on the panel this afternoon and the questions that we'd like to ask. And actually, I'd like to introduce then um, one, of, one of the special guests that I mentioned before, um, Maria from La Paz University Hospital. So she's bringing in some really insightful medical perspectives into the discussion. So I think we'll start now with the um, panel debate and we'll start with you, if we may, um, Anana, on, because as an association, so we're looking here this afternoon of what we call an AI sprint from a technological point of view, the cloud continuum, which David introduced earlier on. But I know speaking to some um, healthcare specialists who also talk about the care continuum. So, it, you know, all of the steps that need to be taken before someone's taken in and, and all the treatment and the, the care, the work that the, the caregivers and a lot of voluntary people give along the way. So we're kind of trying to explore a little bit more in this panel discussion this afternoon, how these two things can come together but also not um, ignoring any of the challenges that might be standing in the way. So I'd like to start with you, Anara, if I may, as you're an association with a very specific focus on patients. So how do you see the benefits of new technologies? First of all, we'll start with that one and then we'll come to the next part of that question. Um, yeah, uh, about... Um... The benefit of this kind of new innovative technologies for from the patient point of view, I think that technology can and is a fundamental tool that can help at different points of a stroke care pathway or a stroke care chain. At present, new technologies can support patients that are 
at risk or those who have already suffered a stroke in different uh, aspects. Uh, for example, the new technologies, they, they could give us information about our baseline health status. They, they, they could give us information about lifestyles that we should change to minimize the, the risk. They also can alert us to possible risks that may occur in the future. And of course, these tools can also be a key piece in the follow-up prevention of secondary stroke and post-stroke rehabilitation. So um, I believe that new technologies are an opportunity for the stroke patient as they can help them. And in what ways I think that new technologies can help patients? Uh, for example, they, they, they could keep a closer control of their diseases. These tools also can uh, also help in education and help promotion activities. They also can help the patient to feel more comfortable and connected with the clinicians and healthcare professionals. And very, very important, uh, they can be uh, essential in the prevention of secondary stroke and in post-stroke rehabilitation. Uh, in, in this scenario, in the scenario that we are nowadays, it, it is very important to know, in my point of view, it's very important to know that nowadays, due to the pressure of care that exists in most of uh, our healthcare systems, once the patient leaves the hospital environment and comes back to, to home, to his daily life, there is a very, very important significant gap and disconnection between these two environments. Um, and moreover, the, the lack of resources available to clinicians in healthcare system does not allow them to deal with the exhaustive follow-up and holistic rehabilitation of a stroke patient in an optimal way. So in this area is where new technologies have a lot to say, a lot to, to, to improve the, the, the situation. Uh, it is essential to have tools that help clinicians and patients to avoid recurrences, as well as tools that support rehabilitation sessions by providing them with a more holistic, complete, and long-lasting approach. Um, also, it's important to, to note for the patient point of view that uh, these tools can never replace the health professionals, but they can be a fundamental or essential complement to improve follow-up control and, and rehabilitation. So uh, if we manage correctly, the new technologies are very, very useful and have a lot of benefit for the stroke patient and also for healthcare professionals. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's how we're, we're bringing healthcare support beyond the point of care, isn't it? And it's about this. I mean, there's a trend towards this is an increasing need for it. Um, COVID has actually um, shown us that it actually demonstrated you get a, a more, even more compelling need. We're going to come back to the challenges in a short while, and now, but thank you. I'd like to pass the floor now to you, Maria, and to give you, you know, give us a, a medical perspective on where you see the main benefits in terms of the, the care pathway or care continuum, whichever term we prefer to use. And then we'll talk about some of the barriers afterwards. Thanks. Okay, yes, thank you very much. I'd like first to thank the, organiza the organization for inviting me to this interesting webinar and also to AI Sprint uh, to invite me to participate as a, a clinical advisory. I fully believe in these new te technologies from the clinician point of view, I completely agree with, with what Enara have said before. And uh, because, because as has been mentioned, prevention is key to, to, to avoid the strokes. Um, it's the most effective measure to reduce the impact of this important disease. And prevention is really, really effective. But we do need not only to inform patients and the population in general about what are risk factors and how to control them and how to, to have a healthy lifestyle. We do really, uh, really need to monitor that this uh, control of risk factors is being done properly. And in fact, uh, when a patient comes to our clinic or uh, once it, uh, the patient has been stepped down from hospital and we, we uh, visit them in the outpatient clinic, we really don't know exactly the degree of control of risk factors. We have to 
rely on what the patient is telling us or on the report from um, from uh, monitoring um, uh, concrete points of, of measure. For example, the patient goes to the uh, GP and the GP takes uh, the, the blood pressure measurement and then the patient gives that value to us. But what we really need is to know exactly along the whole day, how is the a risk factor of that patient being controlled. And we need to monitor uh, remotely, if, if necessary, uh, the blood pressure, the glycemia, the uh, heart rate, if there is any um, arrhythmia or many more things that can be recorded with this kind of wearable devices. And this information can give us what we need to know uh, to um, optimize the control of risk factors for an effective stroke prevention. Uh, also, this kind of devices uh, helps the patient to get involved in their care, in their care. Um, the best thing, the best way to, to to um, obtain an effective prevention is to get the patient involved. And to achieve that, we need to inform them and to, um, to, to convince them that they need to control their own risk factors. They need to, to know what they are happening to them. They need to uh, remember that they have to monitor these risk factors and they have to they, they, they must have their, their take their treatments as uh, properly. And also with all the information obtained um, from these um, devices that the patient can wear to, to monitor their lifestyle, the risk factors, we can obtain important information to build um, um, uh, predictive, pre predict predictive models that will help us to uh, individualize the best uh, prevention treatment for each patient. And this is really important. This is where we are trying to go and, and, and the, the, the goal we are trying to reach, to individualize medicine and to uh, give the best treatment for, the, for every patient, because not every patient are the same. So we need to, to particularize all the, treatment, the treatments uh, available and, and, and to, to select the most effective for everyone. And also, uh, Enaya ha has um, talked about the, the potential of um, new technologies for stroke rehabilitation, um, not only for the um, um, for, for um, longer uh, periods, but also within the hospitals. These technologies, both for prevention, for rehabilitation, and many more things, uh, can really help the physicians as a, an adjective to our treatments to help patients to be better in their lives after stroke. Thank you very much, Maria. Yeah, so, you know, as you were saying, then you highlighted the, the, the increased awareness from also from the patient perspective and also making it more participatory, assuming also for the caretakers at home, but also ensuring, I think this is a key message, and I know it's one that the, um, the medical profession are very, very keen to always underscore, it's all about giving the best possible treatment to patients. So thinking also about that, Davide, how would you see this from a, a research perspective and how do you see your role in contributing to these, these, this, the core missions that we, we've heard from and Ayanara and also from Maria, how can we as researchers or a research community support this mission? Okay, um, I will uh, I will start quoting actually Maria. She just said uh, like something that is very crucial uh, for, research, for research, especially that uh, not each patient is the same. So this is like really true, and uh, and it's uh, you know the the, the foundations of uh, of this uh, new uh, medical paradigm that is personalized medicine, and uh, and like in uh, in my work and in general uh, in the, the, the most advanced um, uh, lines of research in biomedicine is really like going towards the real the realization of this uh, paradigm. So. Um, 
I mean, this is something that we all witnessed at, at least once, unfortunately, uh, in uh, in our uh, in our life. If you have, for instance, two person that are diagnosed with the same uh, uh, medical condition and you give uh, exactly the same drug, this drug will uh, likely work very well in one and, and have a different effect or not working at all in, uh, in the other. Sometimes it can also like, uh, you know, um, provoke some uh, adverse reactions that have different levels of severity, you know, depending on, uh, depending on, uh, on the individual. So uh, why, why this is happening? Because the, the way it has been done, uh, medicine until now is, uh, you know, the, the, the typical uh, one size fits all type of approach. Uh, while personalized medicine is looking for something more specific, something more tailored towards the individual. And, and this is because there are uh, very specific determinants of the health and well-being of each individual, which are characteristics like, uh, you know, demographic characteristics. So the sex, the age, the ethnicity, uh, genetic characteristics, like the presence of uh, certain mutations, a certain chromosomal aberration, then the clinical history, uh, the, the, the drugs uh, that this person has been taking uh, uh, all their life, or maybe you know the, the comorbidities, so other diseases that are co-occurring uh, um, in, in, in this individual, and also very important, we touch a bit upon this in the first uh, in the first presentation, the, the psychosocial factors. So, for instance, where this person lives, where, where this person works, uh, and what kind of environmental uh, um, factors are, you know, playing a role in the in the in the in the health of this uh, of this person, and what kind of also of psychological uh, um, situations uh, uh, surrounds this uh, this individual. So, all these are, you know. Um, determinants of the well-being of an individual and, uh, and and if you sum all up you will end up with having you know that everybody is different and so it's really important to to foster research in uh, personalized medicine for this reason that's very interesting yeah it, you know and, and the thinking about all the variants that we need to take on board and how technologies can help us do this so we now looked at the benefits. I don't know, Nicola, if you want to also help us here um, pull out some of the challenges, because that's what I'd like to um, look at now from or each of your perspectives, because they're very important ones. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to bring you all together today. Um, like, so we, we've talked about, so how, what about actually um, being able to, make this acceptable one first of all to patients to the medical profession to the health service providers because we know that you know it's one thing but finding a, a solution or improving treatment or in healthcare in general but how do we get this off the ground you know also from in terms of procurement in terms of um, acceptance and in terms of you know, we know that a lot of the decisions that are made around um, services and solutions in healthcare are not often done by people with any IT background or they're not necessarily done, um, you know, they tend to cite most amount, it's a different also between the health, the private sector and the public healthcare sector. So uh, let me just sum up then some of these um challenges so first one to anara challenges in terms of financing these new technology enabled um advances you know how do how do you see this as a potential challenge um yeah I, I, one of the issues that must be resolved is that uh, these technologies cannot be a cost to the patient. I think this is the, the, the most important thing, thing relating the financing uh, issues. So I don't know what is the, the, the best formula to finance these technologies. Maybe I don't have the answer for this. I don't know if, if, if they should be financed directly by, by healthcare systems of if or if hospitals should purchase them and supply them to the patient until they recover 
or if technology companies uh, should enter into agreements of new purchasing models to finance these kind of technologies. I don't know. I don't know what is the uh, what is the answer, but I think that this question should be addressed by governments, healthcare systems, and also the technological companies. But uh, after saying that, uh, uh, I'm related with this challenge and taking into account the patient point of view in, in this, in this uh, challenge, I see that one of the main problems related with the economical aspect is that the patient purchasing power and social status is still limiting for an optimal post-stroke recovery and follow-up. In this sense, innovative technologies should be a vehicle to, to, to solve this problem and should be available to all. So they should be not an element that further increase the differences between patients. So it is very important to take this, this in account. And I, don't, I, I think that all we know that people's social status and purchasing power is closely linked to, to better management of different diseases. Uh, David speak about this also, uh, and including stroke also. Uh, and to do more on this, uh, in most of countries after suffering a stroke, the rehabilitation to which patients have access through the social security systems is not enough. And they have to go to complete specific sessions in private or society centers. So in the most of the cases, this cost is covered by the patient himself with those with the best purchasing power have the most opportunities to, to, to have a better recovery. So in this sense, the, the incorporation of this kind of new technologies in the monitoring and the follow-up and the control of the patient cannot be an additional gap for the patient strata, but must be capable of reducing and facilitating the accessibility for the people with limited social and economic re resources. So um, therefore, we need this kind of innovative technologies to help to eliminate the gap that we can be found between the patient. And, in this sense, uh, it is therefore essential to work together uh, so, so that in addition that these technologies have their own function, we know, but they also should be tools that help the inclusion of all type, type of patient. And in this sense, the financing of these tools cannot be an additional problem for, for the patient. So for, for companies, this is an a, a important point to, to take in account and to to yes, to try to solve. So I think that we have a strong work to be done in the near future in order to solve this kind of economic problems. At the same time that innovative technologies comes to live with us. So I would like to know the, the, the point of view of Maria and David in this, in this aspect because they are in the hard side of ecosystem <laughs> regarding the, the economical aspect. David in a company that developed this kind of technologies and and maybe Maria, she is trying to, to use this kind of technologies, and she has some problems. Yes, some problems to 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 try to to buy them or to to speak with the healthcare system to introduce in, inside the system and to yes to to give a, a a better quality of life for for his patient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're not obviously trying to solve all of the problems here in this afternoon, obviously. But I I, I think it's really important that we do have this conversation. Because as you said, we're all part of a loop or a part of a cycle. Um, so yeah, I'll, I will. With that, I will pass the floor to Maria and then to Davide for their perspectives. I, I do like taking the on board though this message. I think when you said Anara, it's essential that we all work together. So with that in mind, let's take. I will pass the floor to Maria and then to Davide. Yes, thank you. Uh, I completely agree with Nara. This cannot be a, a, a further burden for the patient. Um, for sure, these new technologies are cost effective because they can um, save, they can help save us uh, other costs derived from, uh, the, from the stroke itself. If we can prevent uh, a new stroke, then we, we will save a lot of money. And it is our duty to, to convince our, our authorities to, to, to save to, to spend some money on, on these technologies in order to save money later. But uh, apart from this, um, we face another big challenge when trying to implement uh, new technologies in, in, in clinical practice. And the, the first one is, is um, the lack of, of, 
of familiarity with with technologies. I mean, physicians are more or less um, do know more or less about this net te these new technologies and and the benefits they can provide. But I'm not sure if patients are so aware of the usefulness of these of these uh, technologies. And also, um, our patient, our, our patients, most of our stroke patients are old people who are not familiar with uh, computer devices and and these these tools. So we need to to give some information, some education about how to use these, these technologies. Um, we need to, to, to make them trust on these technologies. And it is our duty also to, to familiarize them with, with these technologies, because otherwise we will not be able to use them. So this is also important. And um, well, I'm sorry, I forgot what else I'm going to do. So <laughs> I, I'll come back later. Thank you. No, oh, that's excellent. No, yeah, exactly. You know, I think you raised some really interesting points there, Maria. Lovely, what would be your perspective on the challenges? Yes. Uh, so to, to answer uh, the uh, the question from Enara, no, uh, from the, about the economic aspects, uh, uh, I, I think that AI Sprint is also like a, a positive example in this uh, in this sense because uh, we can see how funding agencies, in this case, the European Commission, is really like betting on. Uh, on this type of uh, of uh, of big projects, so this is this is definitely like uh, at least from my point of view a positive uh, um, a positive sign, no? That that something is moving. That also like even from like from an economic point of view, let's let's say from a founding point of view, uh, uh, there, this is this is really this is really good. But of course, it's not enough. And in particular, the 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 uptake of uh, uh, of the artificial intelligence, in particular. Uh, from the health system, uh, I mean, there's a lot to be done there because uh, uh, there is a lack of trust. Because uh, uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of of problems actually. Also, problems that are problems that are inherent in the current status of uh, of the implementation of so artificial intelligence. For instance, uh, one example that is uh, we we were talking about uh, um, data collected uh, uh, through um, uh, smartphones. So just think about the digital divide that we can see in the world. This is something that also in the first uh, uh, in the first uh, uh, talk clip was uh, mentioned. So like the the view, the information that we have about stroke nowadays is very partial. Thinking about the entire world, and 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 it's even like uh, could be even more partial if we are uh, like focusing on this digital uh, data that comes from smartphones. So there are countries in the world in which basically. People do not access, do, do not even have a smartphone. So it's uh, you know it's something that is a type of research that we can do in uh, in Europe, in the US, in uh, in in other countries, but not in all the countries. So this digital device, the digital divide, is something that needs to be uh, to be considered, and it's also related somehow to to the point that uh, that Maria was was talking about. So you know the importance of the technological literacy of. Uh, of the users, so like they have to understand also that this is important. This is like they have to get more familiar with uh, um, with, with the technology itself, you know, with, uh, with with the vocabulary and with uh, the you know the the, the usefulness of uh, of artificial intelligence. There is also a lot of lack of trust uh, there, and uh, one solution here uh, is, uh, for instance, of course, awareness raising, but also. Uh, Co-creation. This is something that is uh, is really important. So when we develop those models, we want the end user, that in this case is the patient, to be with us a lot throughout the entire cycle of development of the artificial intelligence system. And this is this is very important for, for them because they learn, you know, all the things that need to be learned, and they uh, they acquire more trust. And uh, and it's also important for us to receive a continuous feedback uh, throughout these uh, these developments. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, this is just to answer, you know, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in line with you, Davide, because I think that uh, it's, it's mandatory to include expert patient in the design and development phases of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, if we incorporate the patient from the beginning, we will obtain this continuous feedback of the optimal design, achieving a much more use-friendly technology, able to use by different 
type of patient because it's very important in the case of a stroke that the technologies are focused to use by different type of patient because we have different type of patient maybe patient young person who has important mobility or vision disabilities maybe persons with a, an optimal recovery after a stroke or person over 70s for example who if they have an optimal recovery, but they are not familiarized with this kind of new technology. So if we incorporate an expert patient uh, from the beginning in the project, in, in this uh, design and development phases, I think is one of the key aspects to, to make successful and are more, yes, uh, uh, to, to reach a more acceptance of the technology than when, when the technology reach, reach their market. And also the, the, the European Commission is in this line because uh, in, in most of the project, they are pushing to, to, to incorporate foundations and patient associations inside the project, not only to make uh, communication and dissemination activities, not, not only for this, also, also for, for working in the in other activities at actions uh, from the beginning of the project in, in this first step of, of, of the design and, and development. So I think that the, the foundation, we have this holistic point of view that sometimes the more technician companies uh, need. And, and I think that work together is a, yes, a, a way to, 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 yes, to reach a more acceptance of the technology when, when reach the final or end user. And this is actually uh, an aspect that uh, in the in the personalized use case of AI Sprint is taken into account because there mm -hmm. will be um, there will be you know a, 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 so when we are going to uh, to recruit those volunteers there will be a, a training of those volunteers on how to use uh, those devices no and uh, and how to get the best out of out of them and of course this will take into account all the different situations now that you were very nicely describing all the, the needs no? and all the, you know, all the things that can, uh, um, all the situations that we can, uh, that we can, uh, uh, that we can have uh, because of the, of the heterogeneity, no? of the manifestation of this, uh, of this disease. So this is also something that in, uh, in the personalized healthcare use case of this particular project is taken into consideration as well, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. yeah, and of course, also clinicians like Maria, that she's also involved in, in, in the project because the point of view of the clinicians is very important because they know the, the part of the clinician and also they know very, very well the, the patient and their needs. And so their, their expertise is very, very useful also to, to, yes, to, to make a, a trust, a, 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 yes, a, a development that, that, that finally the, the end user trust in, in, in it. Yeah, exactly, because we've also seen in other cases through European initiatives where, you know, adopting a people-centric approach is really important. Um, so maybe, Maria, you would like to, as a clinician, we work very closely, and it's really nice to also see people like yourself embracing the technology and, and you know, coming on, coming on, the, on the, this webinar this afternoon so would you like to add anything to this? And Nicola, if you could help me with the chat because I can't see what's going on. I have my full screen on. So maybe you could come and wrap up and help with the wrap up on the, for the final message. But over to you first, Maria, with your reflections on what we've just been hearing from Inara and Davide. Yes, uh, it is important uh, that uh, we all, patients, clinician, biologists, uh, engineers, technologists uh, work together to improve uh, uh, patient care and these new technologies may help us a lot, but we do need results published in order to improve trust on these technologies. That's yeah, very important and that needs to be taken on board. Yeah, okay, thank you, Maria. So, um, Nicola, if you'd like to ask the final question, if not, I'll take it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, there's no, so I uh, saw so that our panelists were so good, so they have already, you know, answered some of the questions that, uh, you know, come into the chat and to the q and box. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's really no, no open answer. So, um, stage i mean uh before thanking you all uh we would like to get some you know final takeaway message uh 
from uh, Enara, Maria, and Davide. Uh, so, what would be your your takeaway message? Uh, you know, maybe also uh, thinking about your different perspectives. So, Enara from the patient perspective, uh, Maria and the medical, and Davide on the research side. Mm. I, I can start. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Davide, thank you, go, thank you. <laughs> What's like no. a memorable message that you would like to give to I, any I think, of the following, yeah? <laughs> So yeah, no, I, I you know, the, the, the takeaway is that uh, the, you know, the, the realization of this personalized medicine approach, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's it, to, to realize the personalized medicine approach, I mean, it's uh, uh, the, um, we need the development of trustable artificial intelligence systems. And this is for stroke and this is for many other uh, uh, diseases. So um, uh, the take home message is that we really need to work all together. And this is something that uh, really emerged from, uh, from this panel discussion. So there are many actors, uh, clinicians, the patients, uh, the technologists, the researchers, uh, and, uh, and the, the, even the economists, the governments and the founders. So like all those people together working, all those people working together in order to, uh, to provide a better health care uh, through uh, um, a trustworthy use of, uh, of artificial intelligence in health. So uh, I'll continue. Um, artificial intelligence and technology uh, provide us with a wide spectrum of opportunities to improve uh, patient care, uh, but we really uh, need to work hard to implement this. This, uh, this uh, will help us uh, change the paradigm of uh, uh, stroke care and uh, to a better way of treating patients. So we have to work hard to, to implement and to, to achieve this goal. Okay, and from the patient point of view, I think that um, for, for the patient, uh, for patients, it's very, very interesting to, to, to include this kind of innovative new technologies in, in all care pathway. And we need to, 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 to make more accessible and adapt it and design it for all stroke patients. So it's to, repeating the, the, the same that I said before, I think that it's very important to include the patient association, the patient foundation since the beginning of the project uh, in a co-creation work, uh, Deepening in the in all the needs of, of all types of patient and taking it into account the, the all the knowledge that this kind of foundation have and and helps to 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 reach successfully the the market of of this kind of uh, technologies because there are a lot of technologies that are very very interesting and finally when they reach the market uh, there are some problems uh, to to yes to with that end user so. I think that the incorporation of, of patient in, in all the development processes is a, a key to, to make successful technologies in, in the future. Okay, what a fantastic job you've done this afternoon. Thank you very much. So lots of powerful messages that I think have come out of this webinar. There's clearly a long way to go. Uh, I think this key point of you know involving the patient and is a way also to, you know, lower the barriers later on. We're not just selling something as, you know, an impersonal vendor that's just coming up with a solution. But you know, and and I think the key point as well is that you know this is a this is a, this is a dialogue that has to involve many many different stakeholders. And and as you said as well, also economists, advocates, um, and all of the uh, the many other people involved, not just the healthcare not just the technology providers um, as well. So I think unless, I, I'd like to pass the floor briefly to Rita, who's done such a great job in organizing this webinar and to Nicola as well, if they also may have something to add or a thank you to add to our concluding session this afternoon. Hi. So, uh, um, as, as also all the, all, all the panelists and all the speakers have shared, we have um, been really happy uh, to organize this webinar also to share um, with all of you the work that the Ice Cream Project is doing um, also 
in terms of uh, helping the uh, stroke associ associations to better monitor and um, also let's say prevent uh, also the um, let's say the, the le 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 level of um, stroke let's say in, uh, in Europe and um, moreover if you would like also to get in contact with us and uh, you would like also to see how the research in this field is advancing. We would like also to invite you to visit our website. I will also share the link here so that you can have a look at it because um, uh, very constantly we're also updating it with new information. There is also a specific page on the uh, personalized healthcare, uh, web, uh, let's say, use case. So you, you can really find more information there. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. And, Hello. And just yeah. a small addition. So, uh, <laughs> thanks everyone for joining. And remember, this is the first of the webinar series that we are going to do uh, in the context of AI Sprint. So, we are going to focus on the different use cases that we have. We have three: so personalized healthcare, but also we are dealing with maintenance and inspection and farming 4.0. So, uh, next on the line, there will be. Uh, you know, webinar focused on this use case. And obviously we are also going to uh, monitor and do some webinar on the progress of the personalized, personalized healthcare as well. So uh, stay in touch with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all the presentations and the recording will be available on the website as well. So stay tuned for that. I would like really to extend a big thank you to our panelists this afternoon. You've been really insightful and it's been great to see you all coming together from slightly different perspectives, but as we've shown this afternoon, highly complimentary when we really want to tackle a really significant um, social um, problem that we have to, we have, and we have to deal with it. And we have to find better ways of doing that, preventing it, and of making sure that the quality of life is as high as possible for all those involved, not just for the patients themselves, but the, for the, medical staff and the carers back home as well or in, in care homes as eat also wherever they be so thank you everyone thank you to the audience for joining us and for taking part in our interactive poll um, so stay tuned on ai sprint for more as a follow-up activity and take care everyone thank you bye bye thank you davide thank you maria and thank you nara thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.